All right, so a 1.22 gram sample of pure monoprotic acid HA, meaning one proton, was dissolved in distilled water. The HA solution was then titrated with 0.250 M NaOH. The pH was measured throughout the titration, and the equivalence point was reached when 40 mils of NaOH solution had been added. The data from the titration was recorded in the table below, and I put that right there. So, um, letter A. Explain how the data in the table above provide evidence that HA is a weak acid rather than a strong acid. So, I'll give you about one minute. You can figure it out with your group, or you can figure it out on your own, but you kind of have it together. So, why does the table tell me that that is a weak acid rather than a strong acid? Figure it out. You can talk. That's kind of part of this. You can write whatever you like. I will tell you this, the explanation doesn't have to be as deep as you think. So you just have to state what the data table provides. So I'm going to give you a, a bit of an insight to what you should have written and see if you can finish my sentence. Hey, right, who wants to finish my sentence? The pH at? Jeffrey. That is true. It's greater than 7. There you go. The pH at the equivalence point is greater than 7. Okay? They just have the pH at the equivalence point is above 7, which indicates that HA is a weak acid. Okay, you don't need to start explaining all the differences. Remember, equivalence point is at 7. What does that mean? Strong, strong, right? If it's below 7, meaning acidic, that means I must have a strong acid and a weak base. If it's above 7, I must have a strong base and a weak acid. Be able to see that by pictures or through data. Letter B. Go back to your groups. Write the balanced net ionic equation for the reaction that occurs when the solution of NaOH is added to the solution of HA. What does that look like? Confirm with your colleagues. The chemical equation. There's a key thing, the net ionic, that's important. Those are getting stuck. Kevin, tell me the reactants. Oh. Just the reactants. NOH minus? And honestly, it doesn't matter if it's a single or a double arrow. Like it's, it, You'll be okay either way. Technically, though, it should be single. single because it's a strong. Although you can put a double, and then you could just argue it goes to the right and really doesn't come back. Right? You need a second more if you don't have that finished off. You were looking then and be like, how did you know that? Remember, an acid always reacts with a base. Acid always reacts with a base. But I believe it literally tells you react the HA with the, the NaOH. Jenna, finish it off for me. What do you got? Great. H2O or HOH, it doesn't matter. I like to write, write HOH as much as possible because it is more visual. Either way, it's totally correct. So, Grace, that's all one point as well. Uh, you need to have the charges. If you don't have the charges, you don't get the point. Wait, what's the difference between uh, non-ionic and just... Uh, just the normal? Yeah. You have this. Oh, okay. Is that NaA? Yeah, NaA, which is weird. C. Calculate the number of moles of HA that were titrated. Okay, so think about this. You started with HA. 
help me fix, help me with this. How would you? What, what's the source? Where could you go with this? Because they didn't tell. Usually, they always tell you what you're starting with, and then you have to figure out something else. How do you, Kevin? What what could you do? What could you do? Well, I don't want to answer you this like you could do this. Could you have the pH of the equivalence point? Could you take? Or could you find the molarity at the equivalence point and then divide it by 80 milliliters because that's the total to get your moles or multiply by? So are you saying M1B1? Yeah, saying? but using the equivalence point, like the pH at the equivalence point. So use a pH. I can do at least a the only one of these. Yeah, you could do that. That's a little, I think you could do that. That seems a little longer. There's, I, I hear what you're saying. You're on the right track. Jake, did you say something? Okay, so that, yeah, that's what he's kind of saying too. The problem is you don't have all of that. But it, you're, you guys, you're on there, you have it. Just what? No, and the reason why is that um, H A does not so that, that does not translate to H plus. And then go to the next one. But you don't have a K A. Yeah. Well, you guys, you want moles? Where is the spot that tells you the moles of your H A? It, it doesn't directly say it. What is it, Rory? You do point two five divided by forty. That would be the millimeters. Okay. All right. So where do you do? Where? Why are you picking that? Equivalence point, guys, at the equivalence point. What Jake and Kevin are saying, you're saying it. You're saying it, just, you don't have, you're right. I wanted to get to this. At the equivalence point, the moles of your base equals the moles of your acid. So M times V gets you moles, right? So, I just, I just want to make sure, it's like, yes, we're there. So. If you found the amount of moles of your, of your base, that means that's how many moles of your acid. So please do it. Make sure you guys have the same number. All right, that, that is huge about understanding the equivalence point. Moles of base equals moles of acid. Why M1, M times V? Because moles times, uh, sorry, molarity times volume, what's left is moles. Technically, I'm not feeling good about how I wrote that number. Well, if you put 0.01, that's only one sig fig. You are always opening the door for that problem to say, you know what, we were checking to see if you had six figs and you lose one point. One point for doing everything right if you lose a point. You only lose it once. Try every number. If you can do three six figs, you're safe. Just saying that. I know that's the first time I've said that all year. I'm just kidding. No, I, those are hard because it's like, but that's what I have. Try to add zeros in. I know that's not, that's not normal. I'd agree, except I don't like those calculators. So, we, you get it? Equivalence point? That, that's a huge source. And there, that's just a half the problem designed around that. D, calculate the molar mass of HA. What? What is molar mass? I always use units. Grams per mole. Find them. You have those. Find it. Grams of it over moles of it. The argument, I could hear someone say, wait a minute, it's a weak acid. How do you, it's not all the moles. 
When you react it with a strong base, it's bringing all of it with it. The base is bringing all of it. it ha the, the weak acid doesn't act like a weak acid anymore because the base forces it to the other side. So that's all of it. So 122. Finding a molar mass is pretty common. So again, units. What they almost every problem, whenever they ask what is the molar mass, they probably have either let you figure it out or it's within the problem. So if you can just remember molar mass, grams per mole, uh, there's a point waiting for you. Everything so far has been one. Everything. Now it changes. The difficulty amps up a bit. E. The equation for the dissociation reaction of HA in water is shown below. There it is, 6.3 times 10 negative fifth. Assume the initial concentration of HA solution before any NaOH is added is 0.2 molar. Determine the pH of the initial HA. So, could do icebox? Definitely. If you are recognizing this, help me out. What's the faster, what's the ultimate expression? Molly, what's the expression I'm looking for here? Yep, so k equals x squared over initial minus x, right? You would get that. I'm going to set it up in an ice box. You wouldn't have to do that. I'm just going to do it so you can visually see this. I think it's important to see. So if you're ready to go, figure it out yourself. If you'd like to see how I'm setting it up, that's great. A lot of times that's about as much as you need, and then you're like, oh, I, it's clicking. But if you need to have it all the way down. By the way, if it says, like, show stoichiometric work, <coughs> this would be stoichiometric work. If you ever had, like, I'm just foreseeing the future here, like, show, show your, um, prove it through stoichiometry. You want to show work. This is stoichiometry because you're showing a relationship. But is. Molly said she's putting it in there, right? Products over reactants. You will not be required to do a quadratic. I've never seen one on the actual test. <laughs> the P8, what's it actually asking? It is asking. I did do it right. Oh, well, you idiot. No, I got the question. Yeah, but you sound right. This thing is so acidic, it's like you drop it from the to the floor. That's fine, if that's how it works. When you get zero, is that your something? Yeah, it's zero. Oh, it's point zero two. Oh, that makes more sense. Okay, that makes more sense. That's, uh, check it out, three, three points, which is a lot. Three points for any one problem is about the maximum you can get. This is something that should be manageable. One point is the room for the appropriate substitution in the Ka expression. So did you put it all in the proper Ka expression? Awesome. One point is the room for the correct H plus, and then one point is the room for the correct pH. I've never seen that many points for this. I would have I expected two. For sure. It's, it's worth at least two. But I, threes, that's a nice gift, honestly. Is this just a strong acid? Do you just do log of that? Great question. So if it's ever a strong acid, like uh, point, was it point two? Point two molar of HNO3 or of HCl, automatically negative log and you're done. Yep. But then they also would give you a K. Right. And that's funny because we don't do them for a long time and all of a sudden you kind of forget, like, what? Yep, just negative log because all of it's H plus. 
to it. If they don't give you a K, I think it's a strong message. Probably, unless that there's other hints. I mean, there could be other hints, and then eventually you probably have to solve for a K. But if somehow you know it's a strong acid, then they're just letting you, they're making sure you understand that that concentration is the same as the concentration of H+. Because it all goes, right? It all goes. <laughs> All right, I don't know if we're working ahead. Last problem on here already, though. Calculate the value of H plus in the solution. All right, this is important. I'm not going to say any hints. In the solution, after 30 mils of NaOH is added, and the total volume of the solution is 80 mils. Okay? I guess I'll say one hint. You probably want to figure out the chemical reaction if, if it already hasn't been already figured out. But what, is, what are you doing? I'm going to leave it at that. This is the hardest of the problems. Do it with each other. Uh, um, if you'd like to start it, figure it out as you go, work on it. I'm going to pause the video. Pause if you're doing this at home. All right, so I'm going to just write this first to see if someone can help me. So you are adding an acid and a base together. You have that's called consumption. That's called consumption. So what you need to know it's H3O. Oh, oh, oh. Hold on, hold on. What's the question? It's the exact same for the concentration of H3O plus. Terrific. So we thought we could do it with H plus, but we didn't think we could do it. Well, I mean, this is an acid, and that's a base. So acids lose H's, bases gain them. So this is what's going to be created. So that's the beginning part of this. Let, let's talk about this. There's two ways you can do this, but this is the beginning. This is basically all the things that you do in a titration. So what you need is to see how much you have of each. Here's the hidden part of this. It says 30 mils of NaOH solution is added uh, to a total volume of 80. So that means there's 50 mils, and this, this was the hard, I, I thought the hidden part of it, 50 mils of the HA. What's the concentration of that? 0.2. Okay? So you have that. How do you do the OH? You have 30 mils. What's the concentration? 0.250, where'd you get that? Way in the beginning, right? And to me, this is what I do. I just start cycling through, just in case that they gave me somewhere else, and I just keep going until they gave me something. So it's 0 0.250 molar. Funny. I, this is, there's two ways to do this. So this is the way that I kind of was teaching it with you the whole time. So what happens? There's consumption, right? How much is used up? 7.5. 7.5. Why? Because one has to run out. What else do I know then? Seriously? Seven point five millimoles of the other stuff is created. So, you're like, well, wait a minute. Where's the H plus in this? Yeah. Great, great question. You could find out how much OH minus would redistribute back out, or this is how I see this. I have an amount of a weak acid. I have an amount of a conjugate base. If I ask you pH, what could you do right now? I know that's not. Henderson has a bond. That's how I figured this out. Oh, wait, it says H plus. From pH, I can get to H plus really quickly. So that's how I'm going to do this once and just show it to you. So first, I need concentration. This is the least amount of work. 
the, the guide, the AP guide, it, it, there's more steps. And they, they make you do another equation and then refigure it out again. So what am I going to do? This goes over uh, 80. Understand, at some point in a story problem, there's going to be a longer calculation, if there's calculations. There's just going to be. There's always going to be one spot. Probably the most calculations of the night is this one right here. So it's kind of got to it. So then what I would do? pH equals negative log. This is on your yellow sheet. Oh, shoot. 6.3 times n negative fifth. Base over the acid. How do I get the H plus from a pH? Yes. Good. Yes. And if you ever forget, right, just I'm going to put this on the side. Right, so I know that. Right, so I got to get that. So, exactly. 10 to the negative pH will give me H plus. If you don't like that, there are other ways, there are more roundabout ways to do this. Definitely. Justin. When did you have to flip that equation? This one? Yeah. Uh, the Henderson Hasselbach equation on your yellow sheet, it's provided, like this is what it says. It says pH equals pK. Here, this is what it says on your actual yellow, your um, equation guide, I believe. And then it, I think it says this. I believe. Yep. I think it has a bracket. So if the only time you have to flip it, if for some reason you're working with a base, then it'd be key, uh, pKb, and then it'd be log, and then what would happen is you'd have your acid on top of your base. Okay. And you know what I always just think about? Like this one's acidic, so the structure of it has to be acidic, the bottom of it. This is basic, so the bottom, I'm trying not to say the word base, because again, it would be basic. So I take that. 10 to the oops, negative and I get that. Three more points. So just check this out. If you can't make it all the way, you get as far as you can. One point is earned for the correct calculation of moles of A minus and HA. So right here, that would be okay. Millimoles are okay. It's fine. One point is earned for the appropriate substitution in the equilibrium expression. That's this then instead. That's OK. And then lastly is uh, the answer. So that's uh, another uh, acid base aqueous equilibrium problem. All right. We're going to shift gears to a little bit of a laboratory problem. You can ask questions whenever you'd like, please, as we go. So, here we go. A student is assigned the task of determining the mass percent of silver in an alloy of copper and silver by dissolving a sample of alloy in, access, in excess nitric acid and then precipitating silver as AgCl. What does that mean? It's basically I'm trying to get, I get the silver out using a precipitate. So all of the silver is going to be a solid. So then I can figure out from that solution how much silver was in it. First, the student prepares 50 mils of a 6 molar HNO3. Nitric acid is always very nasty. You always have to store it outside of the acid um, cabinet because it reacts through the bottles with the other acid. A, the student is provided with a stock solution of 16 molar HNO3, two 100 milliliter graduated cylinders that can be read to plus 
or minus one milliliter. This is session number four. Uh, a 100 mil beaker, and that can be read to plus or minus 50, 10 mils. Safety goggles, rubber gloves, a glass strainer, a dropper, and distilled water. I. Calculate the volume in milliliters of 16 molar HNO3 that the student should use for preparing 50 mils of 6 molar HNO3. Please, in groups, read that out. What's the volume of my nitric acid? You need paper at all? Yeah, I just got that one. Okay. You need a calculator? Yeah. You got yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If M1V1 does not jump out to you, you need to reread it again and see. And you're given a molarity and a volume and another molarity, and you're asking for a volume. I mean, it's fitting right in, right? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this first part. We should have. Why am I doing 19? And they went out of their way to do two, notice. Is there five, two oh, five dot. No, but if you did three, you're plus or minus one. So if you did four, you're done. So if it's supposed to be two and that's four, that's that's two away. So that's not plus or minus one. Are you sure? I want to use my calculator. Do I lose the point then? If that's in the grading, you would. Now, I haven't run into one yet today that says that. There will be ones that will say plus or minus, like if they're not plus or minus one in a, on a certain problem, once in a while they fit that in. So that's like we always do three sig figs, we'll be safe. But better yet, look at the problem and do what they give you. That'd be the wisest decision. Okay? Oh. Okay. One point, by the way. So that, just one last time to say this again. What I would do is I'd take 16 mils of 16, sorry, 19 mils of 16 molar, really nasty stuff, and then I'd put it into a, um, a volumetric or whatever else, and then the rest of it would be water. So the whole solution would be 50 mils, 19 of it would be nitric acid. Uh, sorry, 16 molar nitric acid. The rest of it would be water, and that would dilute it to 6 molar. Yep. I'm just like not picturing this, so basically I'm taking So I want to water down this mellow yellow to 6 molar, okay. and it's 16 right now. I poured 19 mils into a container, yeah. right? And then the other 31 mils would be water. And now I have 6 molar okay. mellow yellow. <laughs> All right. Briefly list in steps of an appropriate and safe procedure for preparing the 50 mils of 6 molar HNO3. Only materials selected from those provided to the student listed above may be used. What I'd like you to do, make, we've done this twice already. This will be the third time. We've been doing it thrice. Make a list in the proper order, and you can do it together. You can brainstorm. What would you write? What would, how would you make a solution of this? You only get what they give you, so you've got to look above. So come up with it, proper order. What do you need to do? I've gone over this a few times. If you're watching at home, please pause while they work on this. All right, Hunter, your time to shine. What's your first step? Do you have an apron? Minus one. At home, I do. You are only a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you can only use what they gave you. Do not add things. 
Put on my biohazard suit and and get behind the the, the plexiglass with the built-in gloves. You know, all in one thing. Those are in uh, order catalogs all the time. Like compartments with the gloves. We, like I imagine, like we have like 18 of them in class, and we do all that. All right. All right. Goggles and gloves. Now, order doesn't completely matter for the next couple, but what's one? What's another? Just one more step. What's another step? And if you if you're combining it, that's fine. But what's another thing you need to do? Katie, give me something. Good. So I need 19 mils of the HNO3 in. I'm I'm shortcutting this though, but in grad cylinder. Is there only one grad cylinder that they gave us? Why can't I find that? It's in the first line, Mr. Yeah. Oh. I mean, after Adam. I got you. All right. What's uh, something else someone needs to do? So 31 mils, H2O. How would you do that, Jake? No, good. Good. That makes sense. Now, I've said this before. I'm telling you now, this is the other point. First point was the first one on there, FYI. And it, it, it's all contingent that you have everything else, but you needed to include this. When we were doing it in a volumetric flask, I need to mix this. If you didn't put this in, just telling you now, you need to add this, maybe put a box around it. And anybody tell me how I'm going to which, what do I have to do? I'm going to mix this. I'm going to put this in the beaker. Okay? But someone tell me the proper order. So you can write add the acid to the water in beaker. Or you could say add the water first, then the acid. Reason why is and when you pour it, there's many things that could occur. It can splash. So when you are pouring the, fir uh, the, the second one into the first, usually the, the first solvent is one that splashes. Secondly, the acid would be more diluted if the acid is going to splash because it's going into water that's diluting it. If you're pouring just acid, pure acid, all that's splashing is pure acid. You always add acid and base to water, not the other way around. All right, And then you stir. You have to stir. That's it. Now, there's no volumetric flask. So, you guys, just uh, if this was a different one, we did this twice. Did this twice. You'd add water first. You add uh, the acid, uh, and then you add enough water just below the calibration line. This is the volumetric, correct? Correct. And then you'd add the rest of it with a dropper, cap, invert, and that's how you make it. If it was volumetric, but they're not making as precise of a solution. I saw an hand. I thought or not. So two points. One point is earned for properly measuring the volume of 16 molar and preparing a six molar. HNO3 acid solution. Hmm. I thought they said something with the adding. Oh, one point is earned for wearing protective gear and for adding acid to water because that's a safety issue. So you need both. You need that and the adding water. Uh, acid to water. Triple I. Explain why it is not necessary to use a volumetric flask calibrated to 50 mils. So it's, it's a volumetric flask of 50 mils that's plus or minus 0 0.05 milliliters. What that means is there's an error. It can be off by 0 0.05 mils to perform this dilution. Why is this not necessary? You want to tell me, Kevin? Why don't you have to be exact? Okay, getting closer. Think about how we started. So if we only have 19 mils, we only have two sig figs. Sig figs tells us, you can look at sig figs all you want, it's just saying it's a technicality. It tells us how precise our values are. That's what it is. We can't be more precise than this. So if I'm measuring that much and I'm getting up to 50 mils, there's no reason I need a tenth or a hundredth because I didn't get my initial measurements to be that precise anyway. So the grad cylinder is more than enough because that little amount of error is not going to 
effect, we already have more than enough built-in error. So um, the graduate cylinder provides sufficient precision and volume measurement to provide two sig figs, making the use of the volumetric class unnecessary. It's kind of like saying, hey, we have this really um, uh, unprecise uh, value, and then we're going to try to get really precise to measure the volume when it's not going to matter at all, uh, because it, it, the, the, the initial value is not that precise. So basically, you, you could say a lot of different things, but the volumetric class is more precision than you need. You could just say that. Okay? But what I like about it, they are already telling you we don't need it. So now you just have to put some reason behind it. It's usually what the AP questions are. You don't always have to come up with the answer from scratch. They get a lot of times establish it. And four. Whoops. Move this down a little bit. During the preparation of the solution, the student accidentally spills about one mil of 16 molar HNO3 on a bench top. The student finds three bottles containing liquid setting, sitting near the spill. A bottle of distilled water, a bottle of 5% NaHCO3, a bottle of saturated NaCl. Which of the liquids is best to use in cleaning up the spill? Justify your choice. Talk to each other for a moment. If you don't know this one, it'll definitely make more sense in a second. If you don't know, great idea. If you do not know, start getting the ones out that don't work. By process of elimination, you should figure it out. And then I'll help you with an answer that you could still figure it out with. All right, help me out. Um, Colton, Justin, Jeffrey, Katie, tell me one thing that would not be used. <laughs> what? All right, hold on. So you want to get rid of this one? Yeah. And you're calling that an acid? No. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just confused. It's not an acid. It doesn't start with an H. But, uh, we'll come back to that one just because now we have, I have some confusion of what the meaning of it all is. We have acid spilled on a table. Okay. So, we want to, what, what's the goal? We want to what to the acid? Neutralize, Neutralize it. So what neutralizes acids? Bases. Bases. So what can I get rid of? NaCl. Why that? It's just it's salt. Well, when I put NaCl in, in water, is that acidic, basic, or neutral? Basic. Neutral. It would be neutral, because I'd have OH here, I'd have H here. It's, it's neutral. NaOH, HCl. OK? Water will dilute the acid, but you're just diluting it. This. This is a salt. This is sodium bicarbonate. It's baking soda. But let's say you didn't know that. What's our trick? Put OH here, you put an H here. This is a strong base. That's a weak acid. So this will be basic. And by the way, check it out. It makes this. I don't know if you know this. So you should know this, because every kid does this in like middle school or elementary. You've seen someone. Um, then this breaks up into what? This is carbonic acid, it breaks up into CO2 and water. So that, that's all that gas that comes up, like from a volcano. Like I know that's with vinegar, but sometimes baking soda can also be used to make up a ton of gas and make a huge reaction. So I guess, sorry, I misspoke about the volcano. I was actually thinking about the vinegar. So this was actually your fire suppression system, uh, sodium bicarbonate. It made a ton of CO2. That's not the point. It's this would create a basic solution. 
So let's say you get to this problem and you don't know how to answer it. If you could figure out these two, what you could just say is you should have an idea. Well, wait a minute, I need a base. So by using NaHCO3, it'll act like a base, and a base and an acid will neutralize. Uh, it will create a neutralization. Done. Don't have to go into further explanation. So if you can somehow get to an answer, don't go into so much depth if you don't have that ability. Stop before you start explaining specifics. You'd be amazed what you can get away with. Let me give you your answer. NaHCO3 should be used. The HCO3 ion will react as a base to neutralize the HNO3. You don't have to say that initial ion. You can just say that this, in a solution, acts as a base or, or creates a basic solution. Again, you should have an idea that I'm looking for something to neutralize my acid. Okay? All right. Shifting gears. And this is a uh, lab kind of problem. So slow down, circle things as you're doing these, identify what is going on. Biggest thing, visualize what the problem is asking. Like visualize yourself there. Then the student pours 25 mils of the acid into a beaker and adds 0.6489 gram sample of the alloy. After the sample completely reacts with the acid, some saturated NaCl is added to the beaker, resulting in the formation of the AgCl precipitate. So these are all the precipitates. Additional Cl is added until no more precipitate is observed. So you're making as much precipitate as you can. The precipitate is filtered, washed, dried, and weighed. The constant mass in a filter crucible. The data are shown in the data table below. We've done this. And like, you just keep adding it in a, in a volumetric flask, and then you get a solid. And then what we did last year, we did some suction filtration, where you have a disc, and then we get a solid at the end. That, okay. So B. Calculate the number of moles of AGCL precipitated, precipitate collected. So this is the precipitate collected. I want to know the number of moles. What am I given? Grams. So first, all I need to do is find the grams of my AGCL, and then you should be able to get there. So what do I need to do first? How do I get the grams? Anybody? Yeah, Kevin. So these two? So this is the filter crucible and precipitate. This is just the filter crucible. So if I subtract those, it should make sense. What's left is just the word precipitate, right? And third weighing would be the most because you're drying it out. By the way, that, that could come up in other questions. Why did the student do so many uh, um, weighings or trials at the end? Because it kept, it's getting less, isn't it? Oh, yeah, sorry. They're drying it as they go. So you got to get rid of the water, or else the, the weight of it's not just the precipitate. So it's the beginning of that. But two, don't shortcut these answers. Use all the numbers. Go. So that is worth a two points. One point is earned for the correct mass. So did you interpret your data? Hey, I got a mass. That's actually pretty nice. And then one point is earned the correct number of moles of AGCL given with the correct number of significant figures. How many significant figures do we have after that? So did I do that right? Actually. How many should I have done? How many should I have done? Oh, I did not do that right. 
you can't always use three of them. I'm just saying, I'm just going off this. There's a chance you could, because it's plus or minus. I'm just saying, uh, be aware, when they give you a ton of them, like when they don't give you a lot, you should kind of reflect and go, oh, they only like, gave me one or two. I should pay attention to that. Usually it's always three. When they give you a ton of them, you might want to just, just say. But the safe bet, I mean, I've always meant the safe bet's doing three if you don't want to pay attention to it. But technically, you should always pay, I, I went too fast. So it's seven, or it's, oh shoot, I just lost it. So you didn't even use that number. Mm -hmm. uh, that was amazing. What? You didn't use that number in like the subtracting and the so. Correct, but it's the reason. This is all my data. I hear what you're saying. But once you start like getting data, everything matters. Well, how many uh, stick things are in the first one? Just four? The one I circled is four. I, I, I don't, to be honest, I, I don't know what to say. If you did three, I, I don't have an answer saying if you'd lose one or not. You probably are, are in decent shape, but I don't know that for sure. C, calculate the mass percent of the alloy of copper and silver. Mass percent. So what do you need? You need mass. So it says silver in the alloy of copper and silver. So what you need is grams of silver over grams of your alloy. Okay? So you got to be a little careful with this. I'm going to get you started on this just in case you're like, I have no idea what to do. Mass, moles, and, and grams should go together. So here. And this is actually not in the answer key. They, they, they skipped the step. For every one mole of AgCl, I have one mole of Ag. Wait, what are you writing? If it were Ag2Cl, I'd have two moles of Ag for every one mole of Ag2Cl. You have to get it to the ion. It's asking just, not an ion, sorry. It's asking for just Ag. So in that precipitate, you need to understand the amount of moles of that, how much of that is just the Ag? Okay, then you do the mass, 107.9. So if you're not able to get this part, then you're just you're not going to get it. So I'm going to leave it at that, finish it off. There should be some other, uh, other information given to you somewhere in this problem. Can I need grams of silver over grams of alloy? Sixty-two point four nine percent. And there you go. Great. Close. All right. Again, that's a little bit of lab, a little bit of stoic uh, problems. We'll do one more, and then we'll take a little mini break.
All right. So away we go, though. Keep plugging away tonight. Answer the following questions regarding the decomposition of arsenic pentafluoride. So we're going to the back. A, 55.8 gram sample of ASF5 is introduced into an evacuated 10.5 liter container at 105 degrees. What is the initial molar concentration of ASF5 in the container? What is the initial molar concentration? I'm not saying that the last, I've said this in class the other day, the last question doesn't have to be the hardest one, but I'll tell you now, the first question usually isn't. So I get this one, I just want molar concentration, F or, uh, translation, molarity. They gave me a mass, they gave me volume. So I need moles over liters. Point, is it a point zero three one three molar? If yours is slightly different, we might have a different oh, um, yeah. mole. Your molar mass, you might. If your molar mass is off a little bit, obviously we're gonna have slightly different numbers. But you can see my work. One point is earned for the correct molar mass. Huh. Wow. One point is earned for taking AS plus 5 times F. One point is earned to correct concentration. I shouldn't act like I'm, that's good. God, I'm making it too easy. I, I'd love it to be easy for you. Double I, what is the initial pressure in atmospheres of ASF5? What are you doing? <coughs> PV equals NRT, and if, please, if they ever ask anything that's in PV, NRT, and you feel like they've been giving some of them to you, just take a moment. FYI, P, PV equals NRT. You have four of them. If you, that you need four of those five, because ours are always given. If you have three of those, you can solve for whatever they're asking. So always just take a moment. You know what? They haven't even talked about anything else. They haven't asked about another compound. This is not stoichiometry. This is simply PV equals NRT. So I'm just doing P equals NRT over V. Please write all units. Oops, oops. Nine six nine ATM. All right, please do the next one. Uh, at one hundred and five uh, degrees, ASF uh, decomposes. There is the equation according to the following chemical equation B. In terms of molar concentrations, write the equilibrium constant expression for the decomposition. It should take you at thirty seconds, if that. I can write it. Please, please write it out. Compare with your. Pair with your besties.
I'm glad you came up in basic formal wear today. You're welcome. It's a what? Hmm? Keep your hands in the group. Is it not good to see you? Yeah, but at least I'm saving elephants. Saving elephants. If you put a C, that's great. You just put K. They didn't put a subscript, but I would do KC. The reason why it says concentration. You can also put KEQ. That's your equation. All right, one point. All right. C. When equilibrium is established, 27.7% of original number of moles of ASF5 has decomposed. I. Calculate the molar concentration of ASF5 in equilibrium. Okay. When you started, ASF5 had 0 0.0313 molarity. It's asking about molarity. Uh, you're going to have to still use that. Just because it looks like the problem reset doesn't mean that information doesn't necessarily have to be used. So as it says, calculate the molar concentration at equilibrium. 27.7% of it decomposed. So how much is left? Now, just showing the work, just so you see it. Right? So... Um, got that. So what you really have, just mathematically, is a 313 molar? Yeah. What I have? You have 72.3% of point, did I write it wrong? Paul, thank you. That's right, right? That's what's left at equilibrium. 27.7% has been converted. So what's left? That's what it's just saying. You just got to interpret that. So what I, I'm saying is 72.3% of my original ASF5, which is right here, 3.0313 molar existed. That they had me figure that out first. So 72.3% is left. If I multiply 0.723 by the original, that's how much would be left. That's seventy-two point three percent of it. So it's just—it's not. That's honestly not a chemistry question. That's more of just a mathematical relationship. So hopefully that makes a little sense. Though. Double I using molar concentrations calculate the value of the equilibrium constant KEQ. This is where. They never use it, but I'd suggest it. I think ice boxes are huge. If you figured out, it's all relationships. Hey, if I have this much, I'd have that much. If I have this much, uh, that much was consumed, this much must be produced. But you could also figure it out in other ways, like this. <coughs> That's the initial. Right? What happens? What else do I know? Right here, right? So is that not minus x? So this would be plus x? Why am I doing this? Just wanted to make sure I'm reading this right. Find k. If you have to find k, you need to know all your equilibrium values, right? All the equilibrium values have to equal or have to be known so you can get k. If they're asking for an equilibrium value, then you probably need to know what k is. So all you got to do is find x. Well, what's x? The difference between those, right? So determine that, plug it in, tell me what the k is, if you haven't already done. And I hope that makes sense. I'm asking for k. I must know everything that has to be plugged into k, which they made me do before. They made me find what k equals. So I need to know all three of those things. So I'm going to do an icebox. Icebox organizes my information. They don't do that. They say ASF3 equals F2. And then what they do is they take 0.277 times the original amount.
can also put that in scientific notation if you'd like. One point is earned for setting up this relationship right here, the, that they're both going to be the same on the right side. One point is earned for the correct calculations of these. So literally the x's, because they don't do it with a nice box, but I'm telling you now this is one point. This would be one point, this would be one point, and then the final answer is one. That's three points. Do an equilibrium. You're solving for k. You're using k. Set up an ice box. Final thing, D. Calculate the mole fraction of F2 in the container at equilibrium. What is a mole fraction? It's the moles of what it's asking over all the moles. That's all that is. Okay? So. Mole fraction. You could go back and find all the moles. Or, because an ice box, you can use the pressure. You can use the molarity. You can use the moles. If I, if I find all the moles, it's going to be the same ratio because these are all divided by the same value. Do we agree with Like they're all divided by 10.5 liters mm. and out over their moles. You can take the molarity over all the molarities and you get the exact same answer. So that is a much easier step. There's much less work to do. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to take the molarity of the F2 over all the molarities. And it's exactly the same answer. I could. I could determine. I could, I could transfer each of those into moles by multiplying them by 10.5 liters getting it all out of molarity, or I can just do it with molarity. There is no unit. It's a fraction. It's just a fraction. But you could also talk about it as percentages. So of that container, roughly 22%, 21.7% of it is fluorine, is F2. So you could talk about it in those terms. Okay. All right. We're going to take a little mini break. We've got about an hour left. All right. So, uh, hydrazine is an inorganic compound with the formula N2H4. In the box below, complete the Lewis electron dot diagram for the N2H4 molecule by drawing in all the electron pairs. When there are bonds, you can definitely draw the bonds if you'd like. You can also put dots. So, this is an example. You could do that. Or you could do that, just as one example. OK? So please fill that out quickly, and then we'll get into the next one. It's not meant to trick you, even if you feel like it is. When you're done, you can look up. It's one point should add a total of 14 electrons. It should look. Like that, again, you could do electrons in the middle, uh, but you need to have the lone pairs on the nitrogen. It's one point. B, on the basis of the diagram you completed in part A, so if you draw it, drew it differently, you could get part B correct still. Do all six atoms in the N2H4 molecule lie in the same plane? Yay or nay? Yes or no? Same plane? No. No, no why? Lone pairs. So you would need to say a shape. It is trigonal oh, per pyramidal. <laughs> the answer is no and not Hunter Bud's explanation because it never happens. <laughs> if it didn't have long pairs, it would be all in the same plane, by the way. So those are ALs or something like that. Give an example. So no, it's trigonal planar, so uh, I'll read you exactly what it says, though. It says, no, they do not. The molecular geometry surrounding both nitrogen atoms is trigonal planar. Therefore, the molecule as a whole is not that atom. So, I'm sure if you drop that down, you're good. C, the normal boiling point of N2H4 is 114. 
whereas the normal boiling point of C2H6 is negative 89. Explain in terms of intermolecular forces present in each liquid why the boiling point of N2H4 is so much higher than that of C2H6. So please, at your table, come up with it. I said I just <laughs> That's the biggest thing, though. It has hydrogen bonding. It also has dipole dipole in London, but definitely hydrogen bonding. And then C2H6 is London. And then you should state hydrogen bonding is much stronger than London, so it would take more energy to overcome those forces. Or something like that. You've got to say why one, you got to say that one is stronger, one is weaker. So you can state them. It is not your job to explain what a London or hydrogen bond is in this case. And I've had that confirmed many, many times. Okay. So this is H bonding, and you, you just have maybe two sentences. So N2H4 has H bonding, whereas C2H6 has London dispersion forces, or LD forces. It takes more energy to overcome hydrogen bonding because hydrogen bonds are stronger, or LD bonds are weaker. Oh, oh never, never mind. Okay. One point is earned for the correct reference to the two different types of IMFs. One point is earned for a valid explanation based on the relative strengths of the IMFs. So just know, please, don't lose points that you already understand. You state them, and you say which one's stronger or weaker. And try to re it, it's easier if you relate it to the situation. When it's boiling, you're overcoming those forces, OK? Jeffrey. Um, well, like a covalent bond, that would be one. Like, right here, like these are covalent bonds right here. Like I'm actually literally breaking these up. What's an intermolecular is when there's like a, a an attraction here. That's an intra. I mean inter, 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 inter. <laughs> D. Write a balanced chemical equation for the reaction between N2H4 and water that explains why a solution of hydrogen uh, hydrazine in water has a pH greater than seven. They are giving you all the hints of what this should look like. So again, please come up with what this should be in your group. Match it up. Please don't just wait for me. Or wait for your table captain. You were supposed to elect one when you came in. I'm kidding. Focus on the problem. It does not say that, but usually that would be a good idea. Well, I would assume you just write it down. Two, eight, what are you producing again? You produced N2, H5. What I'm writing on the board should not be a surprise because I told you that's what was happening. Right? So if you're stuck, write out what they told you. What else did they tell me? Uh, Erica, what's something else I know about this uh, reaction? So, so do the simple transfer of hydrogens. This is just one point. Michael, what would this make? Why plus? Because I'm adding an H. You add an H, you get positive. You take away an H, you get negative. That's it. 
How are we supposed to know that? Well, because it told you what reacted, and it said that it was basic. If it doesn't, if we don't know how to write those all the time, and it doesn't specify to do a metaionic, we can just write the normal one. What's the normal one? Where's the NA going? Where'd you get NA? NOH. N N O H. Okay, keep going, sorry. N O H. N O H three. N O H three. Okay, you put me on the spot. You talk I didn't you asked. I didn't realize I got NOH three plus H2O, and then I realized that was wrong. Guys, here it is. If it makes a base, the partner's got to be an acid. This is an acid. This has to be a base, so this has to be an acid. So what do acids do? They lose H's. Right? And H has to go on to that, so it loses an H. This, you can call it a net ionic all you want, but a net ionic usually means that you cross out something that is present. There's no spectator ions here. Everything that we started with is on the other side. We just transferred something. I understand what you're saying, but in this case, there is nothing else. Okay, I think you're overthinking. And I was being a bit of a, I was being a little sassy, making you try to. I was giving you a little sassy for us. N2H4 reacts in air. Wait, wait, what is going to be the explanation? It says write a balanced chemical equation that explains why a solution has a pH greater than. It doesn't actually explain it. The equation doesn't. N2H4 reacts in air according the, to the equation below. There it is. Gives you a change in H. Is there a negative there? Mine's really... Oh, it is. Yeah. Is the reaction an oxidation reduction, an acid base, Ooh. or a decomposition reaction? Justify your answer. Talk with your friends. <laughs> it says justify your answer. Are you just saying that because it has an oxygen and there's an oxygen? It actually does you can write it out. What's one you can get rid of? Decomposition reaction. Decomp always starts with one thing and it breaks down. Okay, that can't be decomp. So here it is. You're looking, is this an acid base or not? Acid base is usually literally transferring one H. If you're not transferring N an AH, then it's probably not an acid base, but you gotta make sure oxidation uh, and reduction that you have something going up in charge and something going down. So this oxygen has a zero charge. Why? Anything by itself is zero. So when it's in something else, this oxygen went to negative two, because oxygen is always minus two. Those are the, the basis for oxidation reduction. We have to have a couple that are always the same. Uh, oxygen is negative two, hydrogen is plus one. So this nitrogen is zero. Why? Because it's by itself. So I know about. Um, and know about hydrogen here, it's got a four, uh, there's four of them, and then nitrogen's minus two, uh, I'm sorry, there's two of them, sorry. So this would be plus one, so it'd be a plus four. So this is, I mean, if you look at this, if this is a plus four, each of these would be a minus two, equaling a minus four. So this one from negative two to zero, this one from zero to negative two. So this one went down, this one went up. That's redox. I guess a big clue to that is if you have an element that's by itself and then you have an element in a compound, it's going to be gaining or losing charge all the time. So this is definitely oxidation reduction, just FYI. The, rea the reaction is an oxidation reduction reaction. The oxidation state of N2 changes from negative 2 to 0. 
Well, the oxygen changes from zero to negative two. One point is F, predict the sign of the entropy for the reaction. Justify your prediction. Jake's is positive. Why? More moles of what? Yes. You're going from one mole of gas to three moles of gas. You don't even have to get into the idea that it was a liquid, which that's a big step. Because you're going from a liquid to a gas, which is even more disorder. The very fact that you're gaining moles of gas is already gaining disorder. And you need to understand that then that would be a positive change in S. You are gaining disorder. That is one point. I will read it actually. What they said, entropy change for the reaction is expected to be positive. There are three moles of gas produced from one mole of liquid and one mole of gas. And that increase of two moles of gas results in a greater entropy of products compared to the entropy of reactants. One point is earned for the correct prediction. Well, then, yeah. The goal is to have a positive, you got to gain this one. Yep. Yeah. Finally, indicate whether the statement written in the box below is true or false. True or false. I was told from a student that at AP last year, he said the favorite thing I told, or said to him last year, he just told this to me today. He goes, uh, you asked me a true or false question, and I said false, and you told me I was close. I'm like, oh. Glad I was helpful. <laughs> the large <laughs> negative change in H for the combustion of hydrogen results from the large release of energy that occurs when the strong bonds of the reactants are broken. Talk amongst yourselves. This has nothing to do with IMFs. If you're talking about H bonding, you are not breaking bonds, you're breaking forces. You are breaking bonds. You're actually obliterating these compounds and then remaking new things. Yeah. Molly, what do you got? What? Your break, so it's, it's saying, this is the statement right now. It's saying that this is a huge negative because you're putting all of this energy in to breaking these bonds. That's what it's saying. Well, it's, sorry, it's saying the combustion results from a large release of energy that occurs when the strong bonds of the reactants are broken. You break reactants by putting energy in, okay? So if you're putting energy in, if it's such a large amount, you're putting it in, it would have to be endothermic. So what does that actually mean? It doesn't ask you to make the statement true. But to make the statement, correct the statement, it would be it has a large release of energy because it, when the uh, bonds were formed, it released a bunch of energy. Or it didn't take a lot of energy to break the bonds, one or the other. Right? But you're, you're putting less energy in than coming out. So if you, if you were just talking about the difference, that's how much energy is here versus that much coming out. Like I have that much going in. Does that look going in or out? I don't know. <laughs> Let's not do arrows. That's confusing. Go energy up. So it takes some energy going uh, to break the bonds, but more energy to release. So that is false. Mm -hmm. So take your time. You have to break them before you make them. Energy goes in to break, energy comes out to release. When you when you make the bonds, all right. What's their answer to that? Basically, what I said. Statement is false on two counts. First, energy is released not when bonds are broken, but rather when they are formed. Second, the bonds in the reactants are relatively weak compared to the bonds in the products. And the reason why you know that is that it's more negative. So as I'm showing with my E's, more energy is released. Is that two points or one point? Yeah. All right. Here we go, going to the next one. In an, in an experiment, all the air in a rigid two liter. 
Class is pumped out. Then some liquid ethanol is injected into the sealed class, which is held at 35 degrees. The amount of liquid ethanol in initially decreases, but after five minutes, the amount of liquid ethanol in the class remains constant. Ethanol has a boiling point of 78.5 degrees and an equilibrium vapor pressure of 104 at 35 degrees. So, a lot of information. A, when the amount of the liquid ethanol in the flask is constant, is the pressure in the flask greater than, less than, or equal to 100 torr? Justify your answer. So you really have to understand what the heck it's all saying. Okay. So, this is where it talks about 100 torr. You probably have to go back through it again. So it says ethanol has a boiling point of 78.5 degrees and an equilibri equilibrium vapor pressure of 100 torr. I'll read it again. When the amount of liquid ethanol in the flask is constant, is the pressure in the flask greater than, less than, or equal to 100 torr? Just by your answer. What do you think? Equal to. Equal to. Exactly. Because the quantity of liquid ethanol is not changing, the gas and liquid phases have reached equilibrium. Therefore, the pressure of ethanol in the gas phase equals the vapor pressure. Like, that's the, th that's the, the vapor pressure that is equilibrium. So if you're not changing the ethanol amount, yeah, it's going to be the same. It's going to be equal. What's the reason you add that again? Because the quantity of liquid, it, you're at equilibrium. Okay. So whenever you're reaching equilibrium, that, that's the pressure that it'll be at. The flask is then heated to 45 degrees and the flask and the pressure in the flask increases, sorry. In terms of kinetic molecular theory, provide two reasons that the pressure in the flask is greater at 45 and at 35. So, by the way, uh, kinetic molecular theory is just how atoms behave, how they interact. So you can talk about a lot of reasons why the pressure is going to go up. So any ideas, any thoughts? They don't have to be complicated. Uh, Emily, give me one. Yeah, so if you're moving faster, more collisions, something like that. Ah, that says collisions. Kevin, you got another one? Well, I mean, you can try to explain that to me. Well, if it's a liquid, no. I mean, but well, we're talking about the pressure, I, though. Well, I did, I think it's wrong. But, like, so. I, said, I don't know if we have mold. According to the PV equals NRT equation, the temperature increases, pressure increases. Like, is that opposite ends? Yeah, so you want to actually... But that's not really related to... You can't use PV equals energy because you know mold, but you could be using gas laws. So you could use a like yeah. gas law or something like that. Oh, okay, guys, you got us. We could be. We should be a, a whole problem faster. If we can't handle it. We can just. Watch the rest of the line. Um, we need to be a little more specific, unfortunately. I'm trying to just read through it all. That that is the the road of it all, but you need to actually be just specific. So the kinetic molecular theory, you got to just say like more collisions would be more pressure. You could say more collisions on the flask. On the flask would create greater uh, greater force. I'm going to just give you some different uh, ideas. Um, so that, that's another one. Um, sorry. Uh, I feel like two of these are exactly the same. That, those are, I mean, basic. <coughs> you could be talking about, because they're moving faster, they'll, they'll collide. I don't like that they're asking two, because it's almost just semantics of how you want to reword it. Because they're moving faster, uh, you could just say they're, really what we did is we named two right here, more or less. Like more collisions, like more frequent collisions on the surface, and then because of that, that creates more force or more pressure. I'm trying, I'm trying to put a, 
I'm trying to make this more complicated than it needs to be. I, by doing that, you probably get both right away. Um, so, uh, what kinetic mo molecular theory talks about in general is is when you collide with something, you make a greater force. But then also, the number of collisions also relates to the pressure or the force as well. So, uh, they're I, I feel like they're kind of nitpicking and, and going out of the way to kind of separate that. How many points is that? That's going to be one. One point is there in free oh, up to two. But it's literally the same. In the second experiment, which is performed at a higher temperature, a sample of ethanol gas and a copper catalyst are placed in a rigid, empty one liter flask. The temperature of the flask is held constant, and the initial concentration of the ethanol gas is 0.01 molar. The ethanol begins to decompose according to the equation below. The concentration of ethanol gas over time is used to create three graphs below. So here we are. C. Given the reaction order is 0, 1, or 2, use the information in the graphs to respond to the following. I. Determine the order of the reaction with respect to ethanol. Justify your answer. I will say this. You do not need to go crazy on your justification. You literally need to just state, well, just state why the graph corresponds to that order. You don't have to explain all the ins and outs of that. So is this zero, we haven't done this for a little while, actually looking at the graphs. Is this zero, first or second order? This is a zero order. This is a first, this is a second. Not because they're in that order. Please, oh yeah, the first one's always zero. Concentration zero. Oops, sorry, sorry. See, yeah, I just did that. I couldn't read it. That would be second order because it's one over, and the natural log of ethanol is first order. Because there is a straight line or a correlation of a straight line in uh, concentration versus time, that re represents zero order. That's as much as you need to say. You don't need to go into more detail than that. So it's zero order. I'll read exactly what they have. The order of the reaction is zero. The plot on the left is a straight line, indicating that the rate of decrease in ethanol concentration is as constant as ethanol concentration changes. Therefore, the rate of reaction does not depend on concentration of ethanol. You didn't have to say that. Double I, write the rate law. Well, what do you do? We do rate equals K, and then you start showing concentrations. So let's just call that X for a second. There's X. What would be the rate law? Rate equals k. Why is that? Because it would be the zero power, which is one. So it's gone. If you put that in there and put a zero, it's okay. Okay. Rate law is just the one substance. Like no, it's all the reactants. Oh, it's but okay. but in a in in with time, this is an integrated rate law. We've only worked with ones that have one react. It's always a decomposition for these kind. But just just the reactants. And that gets confusing because we do Ks for other things and then there's you know, products over reactants. So if it was first order, it would be the CH3, CH2? Yes, okay. good question. And then if it was second order, it'd still have that with a 2. Would, uh, it, none of the rate laws would have a negative K. That would just anger the rate law? Yes. Right. Triple I, determine the rate constant for the reaction, including units. What is the rate constant in all these? The slope. So you'd have to find something. So this is zero times, this is 2000, it's rise over run, right? So now in this case, this is a negative. So the, the, first, the zero and the first are negative slope.
I took the last number. Yeah, okay. You get done whatever you wanted, but try to do something like that. And at zero order, then rate equals k, so the rate's always concentration over time. Two points, one point earned for correct setup, one point earned for correct units. So even if the answer is negative, Remember that you got to have it, yep, you got to always have a positive. Rates are still positive, it's just, yes, these are being consumed. So except for second order, these are always negative, there's the opposites. Yeah, that if you had a negative answer, you lose the point. And you don't gain a point, however you want to word it. Letter D. That was triple I. The pressure in the flask at the beginning of the experiment is 0.4 atm. If the ethanol completely decomposes, what is the final pressure in the flask? So, again, the pressure in the flask at the beginning of the experiment is 0.4 atm. The ethanol completely just, uh, decomposes. What is the final pressure? So, you have 0.4 atm. If it completely decomposes, what do you think the pressure is? So first off, this is not about rate. It's not asking how fast this goes. If we change concentrations, it was a question about concentration. The rate's always the same. It's just simply saying I have 0.4, and all of it goes to the right side. So if you just think about this, anytime you're given pressure, concentrations, <coughs> mol uh, so that's molarity, moles, whatever's lost on one side is gained on the other. You could do an ice box for this. So if you have 0.4 to start, pressures work. Pressures are like concentrations. You gain, you have one mole on the left of gas, you have two moles of gas on the right. So it would be 0.8. The reason why is it went from one mole of gas to two moles of gas. So the pressure doubles. And that would be the justification. We're going from one to two moles of gas, so the pressure doubles, so it would be 0.8. One point. Okay. Move it along. All right, do a couple equations here. These aren't always easy. They're not exactly like this on the test any longer. These used to be at the middle of the test. A long time ago, you used to have eight of them, and then you had to select uh, five. And then eventually what they were finding out is classes were li literally memorizing the 140 different equations that you could memorize. It wasn't really about chemistry anymore, it was just about memorization. So then they started doing three with a follow-up question, and now they've even gotten rid of this. But I think they're really appropriate because this could show up within problems. They do all the time. Hey, here's an equation. Explain why this happened. So we should be able to still do these, but I do think that these are a little bit harder than maybe uh, we would have in an equation. Maybe, maybe not. So. Uh, let's just go through this, and then um, we're here until 8.15. I have one more thing I want to at least start, uh, and I, I won't keep you longer, though, than you have signed up for, I guess. So, Solid magnesium hydroxide is added to a solution of hydrobromic acid. Write the balance equation. I'm going to get you, I'll do the first one with you, and then you're going to work on the next two. So I'm going to do a little work up here. Solid magnesium hydroxide. So that's solid. We're doing net ionic, by the way. Net ionic. Solids stay together. What breaks up? AQ only. So solution. So that's going to stay together. This is a solution of hydrobromic acid. Hydrobromic acid is a strong acid. So I would have this and that. So, and we can write that. We can definitely write it all. We can always cross out stuff later. If you're not sure, you can always do work. So we might cross stuff out. You may not. We'll work on it.
In a way, what does this look like? A more simple kind of equation that we did last year of the five. So synthesis, income. It kind of looks like a double, doesn't it? Kind of. Also, remember, what do acids do? The H attacks and rips it up. So it's going to break that apart anyway, but it does, it resembles or looks just like a double replacement reaction as well. So the H is going to rip that apart. So what is the H going to bond to? OH. So you have OH, HOH. That is already a liquid. So we have made a quote unquote precipitator. We've changed some sort of state of matter. Not technically precipitate, I get that. So then, what is going to happen is that Mg now is going to be in solution. Basically, it's going to be with that Br. What, how do you know that that's not together? Mg, Br, because halogens are soluble except with Ag and Pb. So. That would be my equation. If you were to write it like that, drop it out. Perfectly fine. So if you want to put a uh, 2 in the OH, or HOH? Well, I have two OHs here. I have one O. Yep. Double I. What volume in milliliters of a 2.0 molar hydrobromic acid is required to react completely with 0.1 molar of solid? Um, Magnesium hydroxide. Well, that's a base. This is an acid. So that sounds like consumption or neutralization, however you want to view it, okay? So if I if I have two molar of this and point one molar of that, sorry, point one moles, sorry. What volume reacted completely react to this? Let's see more of this because it's it's an interesting It's about more ratios. So technically, the BR would have a 2 as well. So if you have 2 molar, uh, well, actually, you could say that, oh, sorry. You always want to end with what you're being asked. So I want to know the volume of this. So I need to start with the 0.1 molar mole of hydrogen of solid magnesium hydroxide. So if I have 0.1 mole of that, how do I get to the other one? So what's the first step? What do you think? Is that a hand? Here, well, here, let me let me write it out. And I, I, you know, I will publish. I'm going to start one at least. So what do I need? I need a mole ratio. For every two of these, I'm not saying this is an easy question. This is this is kind of a little more difficult than most. I'll say that. I I, I need to know how many moles should be present if I have that much. I don't think I'm going to have room to do all this. And then here's the trick. It's saying what volume of a 2 molar. You have to let units help you out. You want volume. I'm in moles. What is this? And I, I think this is not many people. I didn't look at the stats of this. Not many people probably got this right. I need to get to volume. So for every two moles of HBr, I have one liter of it. What? That's two molar. I just flipped it. And then you have to convert it to milliliters. This, this is a hard problem. This is, this is actually one of the hardest ones I've ever seen on a follow-up question. You can do, wait, 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 what? This is just two molar inverted right here. So after you divide it all and everything else, and you have liters at 0.1 at the moment, eventually it's going to be 100 milliliters. So that's just stoichiometry, really. Right? That, that, one's, that one's not straightforward. But what I did is, if they're asking for the volume of 2 molar, I need to start with the other item. And the only way to get to the other one is you need to use mole ratios. And then you look at it and go, well, wait, it. I'm in moles. I need to get the volume. This has one of those, so I can cross that out and get to the other one. All right. Maybe I'll do one more with you here. And once 
went through a bunch of these to kind of look at it. Excess hydrochloric acid is, at, is added to a solution of cobalt 2 nitrate to produce a coordination complex ion. A coordination complex, like a coordinated a, a coordination compound or a complex ion. So hydrochloric acid, HCl. Cobalt 2 nitrate. So they are both solutions. So we want to write it all out, that's fine. I have no problem crossing stuff out later. What's one thing I know is going to get crossed out? NO3. To be honest, I don't even ever like to write it. But I'll write it just for you to have a visual. You're welcome. We, this one's not the norm. What has to happen is a ligand has to attach to a transition metal. Okay? So right now, this one we haven't had too much. So I just want to let you know we had these floral chloros, all that stuff. So it's actually going to be chlorine that's going to attach to that. How many chlorines? Four. Why four? Double. Charge is 2 plus, and it doubles what that charge is. Be very careful. What is the overall charge of this ion? 2 minus 2, two, minus, two, two minus. minus. Cobalt's 2 plus. Chlorine brings 4 negatives. You get a difference of 2 minus. That's how complex ions work. Whatever the charge of your transition metal is, you have double the ligand for complex ions. So you'd have to be told it's complex ion. We've always had double in the we were doing this. All right, and then. That's going to be canceled out because we're just making that compound. To be honest, we're done with that. <laughs> this is funny. Any number of coordinated CLs ions from 1 to 6 is acceptable. <laughs> That's funny. Which species acts in the reaction? Oh, get away. These are all. I don't like these. It's like haunting me. Lewis bases need lone pairs. Meaning it needs electrons. So whatever has electron. <coughs> so which species acts like a Lewis base? So which one has extra electrons in the actual equation? CL. CL. And it's got to be on this side. It's got to be. It's got to be a reactant. So it's going to be CL because it has a negative. It has extra electrons. So Lewis base has electrons. Don't you need to balance it, or do you not balance it? All right, last one. You should be able to do this one. I'm going to let you. This one is very uh, uh, classic, very typical, and it's very much in your wheelhouse. So please answer this. This one could come up in any free response question. Easily. Great question. Yeah, but you're going to need to know it later. <laughs> when you don't know a charge, guess two. It's kind of standard. That is the most common charge of a transition metal. You could get away with being one. <laughs> it's not one? Is that CU? I just said you could guess one. Copper can be one or two. How are we supposed to know that? Unfortunately, over experience, you should start knowing some of the charges. So they don't specify what the actual charge is. I would guess two. But you would get away with one. 
for this one you would, but if it was like tin or lead, those are only twos and fours. Iron's two and three. Um, vanadium is two, three, four, five, and seven. I mean, you got to know. Guess two. Guess two. If you're like, I have a hard time with this, you can write it out normal first, meaning just put it all out there. And then take a look. I mean, that's what it's going to look like initially. Yes, I have not balanced it. No, I was going to say look at the AG and then I'm going to break up the solution. Correct. I'm saying, though, this is how we used to do it. I'm just to help you with the net ionic. Yes. So if it's a solution, it breaks up in ions. So then if it breaks up in the ions, we write what it is. It's a classic single replacement reaction, meaning that you'll have a metal, you'll have an ion. So the other side, now you have your metal, and now you have your ion. So then you need to balance the charges, and it should look like that. Is this a redox? It is a redox because you went from 0 to plus 2. Here you went from plus 1 to 0. You went up and down. So all single replacement reactions are also redox reactions. Follow it up. Describe what is observed as a reaction proceeds. You have three different answers you could give. I just need one. Okay. Um, well, is, like, is this like a battery? Like it could be a battery. I mean, this could be a battery. It's not saying that because you're just putting a wire inside of a solution. So this is not technically a battery, but could, could have been involved if there was more to it. Would you say that like, silver is being plated on the wire? The Done. The, you could say that the copper wire is starting to turn silver. There's silver being uh, placed on the wire. Yes, that is one observation. You're going to observe that it's single replacement? <laughs> no, that's not a good observation. <laughs> you, cannot you, you can't say things like, you're going to observe that the copper will become 2 plus. That's not a good observation. What's another observation? Observations are like colors, are gases, are things changing colors. What else? There's two more. I want to get them all. So one, the copper wire will be will start turning silver, or silver will be plating on the copper wire. What's another observation you could see, uh, Jeffrey? Can the silver be precipitated? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I hear what you're saying. Unfortunately, that's a double replacement reaction, so it, it will literally go onto the wire. It's not a bad thought, but no. The solution will turn to. Blue, ding, 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 Logan George. Why blue? Because the solution is turning to copper. Copper's blue in solution. It'll turn blue. We are supposed to know that. That was one. That's one thing you're supposed to know. And lastly, you could. This one's less obscure. Those are the two I'd expect you to know. You could say that the copper wire is what. Don't worry about the silver part. The copper is starting to. Disappear, lose mass, Go dissolve, into going into solution, losing mass. Okay. <laughs> um, I did have something else. I'll either put it online or we'll do it tomorrow night. Um, I'm not going to keep you. I'm, 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 that's it. So thank you for coming. If you have uh, items for breakfast, please bring those in by tomorrow.